Hi, everybody. Welcome to our 23rd episode of Financing Philadelphia's Future. I am Vanessa Lowe, your host, and um, I am the co-chair of the Power Economic Development and um, Economic Strategy Team. Um, I also have a show on G Town Radio called Vanessa's Money Hour. Welcome, everybody. As, as those of you who've been with us before know, it's a quick half hour. And today, I am very excited to welcome our guest, Nicole Levy. Nicole Levy is a candidate recommended by the City Council to Mayor Kenny for the Board of Directors for the Philadelphia Public Financing Authority. We call it the PPFA. She's devoted her career to the promotion of fair credit practices and other aspects of economic justice, developing expertise in banking law, as well as data analytics. She has experience in the regulation of financial services from corporate, nonprofit, and governmental perspectives. She's worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and TD Bank, where she managed the bank's fair lending program. Nicole is a Southwest Philadelphia resident. So the, today's going to be a little different in that Nicole's going to have pretty much all the time, um, or most of it anyway, and she's going to start with a presentation about the financial marketplace in Philadelphia and how it relates to public banking and how the PPFA fits in. So, um, and then looking forward to the upcoming mayoral election season, um, she's also going to share her top three policy priorities for the next mayor to consider. Nicole, you have the floor. Great, thank you, Vanessa. Um, so yeah, understanding, you know, that we're coming up on the election season next year and that the focus of these, you know, um, this program is gonna be shifting towards the upcoming election, I have to say that I have really been so excited for this episode. Um, it feels to me almost like I've been viewing it as a, the best Christmas present I could dream of. It's um, here's my chance to lay out the economic development agenda for our next mayor. Um, but as today was drawing a little bit nearer, a, a slight feeling of panic began to creep over me. Uh, these policies to grow our local economy are big topics and there's no way to cover them all in 30 minutes. Um, so what I decided to do is take my top three priorities and really just lob them across the goal line uh, before we do anything else today. Um, we're not going to be able to cover these as in depth or as deeply as I'd like to, um, but at least, at least we can put them on the table and then I can focus on spending the next 20 minutes or so really just teasing out some of the more interesting um, aspects of some of these policies. So what are they? What are my top, top three policy priorities? Number one, we need to convene stakeholders and repair systemic racism. There is no financial future for Philadelphia until we do this. Number two, we need to create and empower local financial institutions, obviously, and most importantly, including public bank and the PPFA. Uh, finally, number three, we need to more actively monitor the marketplace to maximize investments and compliance with bank laws. So that's it. Those are my top three priority policy priorities. Uh, we'll tease them out and jump straight away into my comfort zone, which is Excel tables. So as Vanessa said, I am going to start out today talking about the financial marketplace in Philadelphia and how public banking fits in. So any financial assessment needs to start by taking a look at money in the bank, right? So what have we got? Right here is the FDIC's deposit market share report. This is published annually, and it shows all the FDIC insured money in the bank by both geography and lender. First up here is a ranking of metropolitan areas by the size of their deposit market. The Philadelphia region is the seventh biggest market in the nation out of 393, but don't get too excited. Philadelphia County only comprises 67 billion, of that 598 billion market in the Philadelphia region. Okay, deep breath. We don't have as much money in the bank as I'd hoped. That's a little disappointing. But the next question then becomes, okay, where are we banking? Who's holding our money? Um, so this list down here shows, um, it's just truncated to show the top deposit market holders in the region. Um, and you can see what they have inside of the Philadelphia market, what they hold outside of the Philadelphia market. 
their number of branches, their deposits, you need to add three zeros to this number, and then their share of the um, Philadelphia market. And as we scroll down this list here, we see that virtually all of our money is held by large national banks that are not locally headquartered. Um, I should acknowledge also that we do have some credit unions, some large credit unions, police and fire. Citadel would register on this truncated list as well. So based on a comment I had heard a couple weeks ago about easier access to money for affordable housing in Pittsburgh, I decided to take a peek at our sister city on the west side of the state. Boy, was that a mistake. She has double the amount in the bank that we do. You can see these numbers up here. And then when we look at the financial la landscape in Pittsburgh, it's also a different pit picture from Philadelphia. Of course, the large bank that dominates the mar market in Pittsburgh is headquartered right there in Pittsburgh. Um, and then as we look at some of the other players who are pretty high up in the market share, we see a lot more smaller regional players registering on the list. So. What do we take from all of this? If I were the incoming mayor, I would be very concerned about our collective lack of money in the bank. So next question then is, what do we do about it? Before I dig into this um, sort of illustration, my illustration, I guess, of what a healthy financial marketplace should look like, let's just recall together how banks make money. They receive deposits, they hold a small fraction in reserve, and they use the rest to make a variety of investments and loans designed to maximize profits and minimize risks for executives and shareholders. The investments and loans that go out the door to circulate in and grow the economy of the particular bank's market area. So if we think about it, national banks serve a national market, meaning that Philly deposit dollars may be circulating in Miami or New York or Silicon Valley. Profits earned will be distributed to wherever and whoever the owners are. So the problem as I see it with the Philadelphia financial landscape is not Wall Street banks. And I do want to be clear about this, right? In any financial marketplace, there is a place for large national banks. We need them here. They're very good at standard products, at scale and efficiencies. But they aren't good, especially when left to their own devices, at knowing the local markets and reaching deep into local communities and providing non-traditional products or services. That's where we really need local institutions to fill in the gaps. So let's turn to this pie chart here, right? Um, as we learned looking at the FDIC deposit totals, this is not what our marketplace looks like. For one, we don't have a public bank yet. Um, we have no large local bank uh, here in Philadelphia. In terms of women and minority-owned banks, we have Asia Bank and we have United Bank, which is Black-owned, um, but their sliver of the plot pie is very thin, nearly negligible. Um, credit unions um, do have a slice of the pie. It might be close to this or a little bit smaller, but the rest of our deposits here in Philadelphia are held by large national banks, which would make for a healthy financial landscape if all of our neighborhoods were interested in building state, uh, stadiums. But we're not, right? We have a variety of economic development goals, which is why we need a greater variety of players. Segue or, or sort of aside here, some people will ask, you know, why do we need special banks for Black people or Asian people or Hispanic people? Let me tackle this. One, when your banker speaks your language and knows your community, access to credit becomes easier. Um, and two, when you look at the shareholders, the executives, the employees, and the customers at most national banks, they are predominantly white. That is the truth. As long as we have white banks, we need to be intentional about creating and empowering brown banks as well. So the message to Wall Street with all of this isn't that, oh, we're coming to take your market share. The conversation really is about working together and having a plan, a, a plan to grow the pie um, and letting them know here's how you can support, right? And get credit for helping local players reach these markets that the large banks struggle with. Because remember, a shrinking market, market size or a shrink it, shrinking market piece of the pie doesn't mean less money. Think about Pittsburgh's pie, double our size. A 10% share in Pittsburgh 
is the same amount of money as a 20% share in Philadelphia. So let's divvy up the shares. Let's start growing the pie. Public banking. So uh, right now, there are 13 banks that are authorized to hold city funds. Our city treasurer works with these banks, and they provide a variety of services for the city. Cash management, payment processing, debt servicing, debt issuance. I don't think anyone is saying that we open a public bank and overnight move all of those activities and the administration overhead associated therewith over into that public bank. It's about adding a public bank into the mix of authorized depositories, finding those reserve pockets that we can put to work to grow the city's budget because none of us want more taxes. So how do we grow our money and uh, put more? Oh, so how to grow our economy and put more money into our bank accounts? We build up our players, we make a playbook, and we execute on those ways to work together. Public banking. Um, if you are asking what is a public bank, honestly, there's there's a ton of information out there on the coalition's website at philopublicbanking.org and elsewhere on the internet. Um, I think the only thing I'll say here is that public banking is not a new or a novel concept. It has a long history with broad support across political spectrums. Um, and it has a long history and a lot of public support here in Philadelphia. Um, I just want to highlight the work of the Public Banking Coalition. We have a small but mighty core of volunteers and a large list of members uh, who are working hard and consistently to bring a public bank to Philadelphia. We have fun. Um, here you can see these are two pictures. Uh, we're getting our picture in the paper. Uh, we just hosted a People's Economic Forum last month that drew in more than 70 people. Public banking has a lot of support here in Philadelphia. Um, 2022 was a great year. We, we um, helped bring home a legislative victory with the passage of the bill to create the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority, which is an economic development authority and a precursor to a public bank. Um, so this is where I'm going to stop here in a minute, um, take a breath, and hand the floor over to Peter Winslow, uh, one of the other community-based board nominees for the PPFA. I think just two things I want to highlight here first about, about the PPFA is, one, this authority passed into law but is being single-handedly blocked by the sitting mayor. Very excited for the next mayor to come in, pull this off the shelf, and get us working. Uh, number two, the original bill sponsor for this really spoke a lot about um, this down here, the small business benefits of the authority, but I want to emphasize that the P PPFA is authorized to address nine focus area, which cover a much fuller breadth of our city's economic development needs. So I'll pause here. Peter? Uh, thanks, Nicole. Uh, that's a great summary, and I'm going to give a quick uh, look back and look uh, forward and to uh, where we've, we've come from and where we're going uh, as we stand at the end of 2022. As you say, this has been the, the best year and the most productive year that the coalition has had since it was formed in 2012 um, as an outgrowth of the first national conference on public banking that was held in Philadelphia. Um, so the mayor uh, has refused to uh, implement the law. Uh, and he would do that by appointing the candidates that were recommended to him by city council for appointment to the board of directors of the Philadelphia Public Financial Authority. And although he sent a letter to council member Green on uh, June 26 saying, forget about it, uh, the candidates who were recommended to him by uh, city council have said, we're going to go ahead anyway. Uh, as if the appointments had been made, and do the things, the nuts and bolts things, uh, the research, the public outreach that's necessary and will be necessary anyway, and we'll let the next mayor uh, uh, take the uh, ordinance that's uh, that's already law off the shelf and implement it. Uh, and to that end, the first thing that we did uh, almost immediately was hold our first uh, public meeting. Uh, we looked at the legislation that we helped to write, and we uh, we saw that uh, there was an annual meeting was called for. We decided that was insufficient. We want to have quarterly public meetings. So the first qu uh, quarterly public meeting was held on 
July 6th of, of this year. And the second was held on October uh, 28th of this year. The third public meeting will be held uh, on uh, January 20th of next year and uh, that from 1230 to 1 on, 1.30 on Zoom. And I'll put that information into the chat. Uh, we expect that the next mayor is going to implement the legislation. We're disappointed that the current one is essentially a scoff law. Uh, and uh, we're looking for, uh, for the candidates for mayor in particular to have an opportunity to describe uh, what they will do uh, with respect to the uh, financial authority and the uh, public bank uh, project. Uh, and for that uh, purpose, uh, going forward, the Financing Philadelphia Future has set four dates where we will have recording sessions, three-hour recording sessions for one-on-one -on -one discussions with the mayoral candidates. And those dates, I'll also put in the chat, are January uh, 17th, 19th, 26th, and 27th from uh, one to three o'clock each. And, um, and they will have the opportunity that you're having now, Nicole, to, to tell the world uh, what your priorities are, their priorities are, our priorities are, for going forward for financing Philadelphia's future with a financial authority and a public bank. And back to you. I hope you. we're all taking notes today, Peter. <laughs> uh, they'll be in the chat. All right, uh, let's see, our Zoom share. Thanks, Peter. So I think that was what I'll cover for the first part, which was really my, my sort of second policy priority about creating and empowering local financial institutions including a public bank and the PPFA. We need to get that done. This stuff's sitting on the shelf. We don't need any new laws to do it. Let's just get in there and do the work. Uh, what I'm gonna pivot into now is my third policy priority. And this is the one where I think probably I have the deepest subject matter expertise. So most likely to let the clock run on this. So I'm gonna try to cut um, and move through this um, as quickly as possible. But this is about making sure that there are folks in the city who are monitoring the marketplace, um, the variety of bankers and players who work in our city in order to maximize local investments um, and also to maximize compliance with consumer protection laws. So there's a wide variety of federal, so federal regulations make available a large body of data and tools that we can all use. Um, the trick is we just need to have people in the city who are looking at it, right? If we're watching metrics and trends, trends will go up. They'll go in the direction if we want. If we take away that microscope, if we're not looking at what anyone's doing, who knows how they're performing. So the way I sort of mentally divide up the body of consumer protection um, law out there um, and from the perspective of what the city could do with it, I put it into two camps. On this side over here on the left side, it's almost like day one do you mean to tell me we have not been actively monitoring this stuff for the past two decades kind of camp? So this, this left side over here is the sort of WTF, we need to do this yesterday monitoring. Um, I'm not gonna go deep into the Community Reinvestment Act because I know there's a lot out there on the internet, but um, it's really a great tool for community groups and, and local governments to work with regulators to define what the community needs are in a neighborhood and hold banks to those standards and in investing there, right? So there's a lot of sort of baseline monitoring that I think we need to stand up in a more real way. Um, at present, the city treasurer's office does produce an annual report that sort of touches on some of these areas. Um, oh, sorry. Mortgage data, some sort of call report data from banks, but that report leaves a lot to be desired. Um, and it looks only at the authorized depositories of the city. We really need to be looking at, at all of the players in the marketplace. This um, right side of the chart here is kind of what I think of as my expansion pack. It's my dream vision. It's how we should be overseeing and regulating the financial services sector. But I think what I want to do is kind of move quickly through some of that and just get back to. I'm not going to touch on small business. I think we all know and can understand how small business loans are directed into the wealthiest income tracks of the city. 
we need to talk about that. We need to uh, address that. But what I want to focus on here is, I think this, I'll, I'm going to do this analysis. So um, this is something that I looked at after sitting in on one of the 57 block coalition meetings. Um, at that meeting, we were talking, uh, community members were talking about the correlation between historically redlined neighborhoods and the 57 blocks most impacted by gun violence. My initial some assumption was that those neighborhoods are also redlined today. And so if I just flash over across the city, that is true, right? We can see of all of the mortgage loans in 2021, 47% um, of all the loans went to white borrowers and only 18% went to black borrowers. So we can understand, we see that there is a big gap in lending that sort of comes out to about nearly a billion dollars a year for black communities, right? So we know that those lending gaps exist. But um, I wanna pop back to this community uh, event because a woman spoke up to say, you know, let's forget redlining for a minute. Has anyone looked at the correlation between investors coming in to take our homes? Um, she was talking about how they've been, you know, trying to get loans for home improvement, trying to buy and clean up vacant lots for years with no luck. Um, and how frustrating it is now to see these outside investors coming in and stealing our neighborhoods right out from under us. Of course, I went in and looked at the data and she was right. So what we see here, this ugly table on the right side, is a list of all of the census tracts that, com that comprise the 57 blocks most impacted by gun violence. And you can see the percentage of mortgage loans in each of those census tracts that went to non-owner occupied residents. Um, this one census tract in particular, it's west of Broad Street. Here's Broad Street running down the center of the map, north of Montgomery and south of Susquehanna. Um, we see 70% of the loan, 78% of the loans in that um, area are going to investors. Um, and we see huge disparities in denial rates for black applicants compared to white applicants. But then when we look just, so here's that, here's another picture, that same census tract we were just looking at, census tract 153 uh, is right here. We go over a few blocks. Um, and that's where the picture is different, right? We see um, investment being flooded into this neighborhood and virtually very little lending going into here, just one small business loan in 2020, just 49 home loans in um, 2021. Um, so the point of all of this is just to really highlight the need for community direction and control when it comes to looking at these analyses when it comes to painting the picture of the economic story for our city, uh, when it comes to informing bankers and politicians and really directing and owning investments to where they most need to go to grow the economy for all of our neighborhoods. So I'm going to pause there on that. That was my second sort of recommendation, looking at ways that we could begin to better use the wealth of public data that's, about, that's out there, made available by um, federal regulations in order to better oversee and communicate with industry about deciding what our economic development needs are so that we can get intentional, uh, intentional about directing them where they're most needed. Um, so I'm gonna pause there, take a breath, um, turn it back over to you, uh, Vanessa, for any questions, things that um, we may be missing before then I'll move into the final recommendation. Well, Nicole, let me let you take your breath. Uh, fantastic information. I see that you are a data guru, as I am, um, but I think you're 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 sort of super data guru guru. Um, since it is four fifty five and we need to end in five minutes, um, Peter, if you have a quick question um, from the chat, let's go ahead and get that out there. Uh, Vanessa, I don't. I think it makes okay. sense. Let's keep going. Let's go. Let's keep going and turn it back to Nicole. I have one. I have one. I'm going to All right, let's hear it. Let's yeah. Hear it. yeah. Um, so couldn't, uh, so one of the things just popped into my head, but should have been obvious and we should be talking about it a lot more. Public bank could 
generate support for the development of credit unions throughout the city in, in those uh, de deserted areas where there's no lending to poor folks. It's in part because there's no bank, there's no financial institution within walking distance. Um, so that could be a function, it seems to me, an important function. Yeah, and I, and I think Stan, I think that's the, the 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 message overall is we need to recognize that we need a variety of players in Philadelphia to fill a variety of needs, and then talk about how they work together and support each other. So yes, one hundred percent. Okay. All, All right. right, Nicole, why don't you finish up with your comments and uh, yeah, we'll and this closing. is the... so um, this is the biggest one, right? I think. I was out this morning at my kid's school uh, ringing a bell. We're collecting uh, donations for the um, teacher's holiday gifts, right? So today it seems like it's my turn to ring the bell and people across the city right now are standing up to say, you know, we, we, enough is enough. We, we really need to call restorative justice action to acknowledge and repair the economic harms of systemic racism, right? People are ringing the bell here in Philadelphia nationally as well too. I think a lot of people saw California panel. They um, have a test task force on reparations. They're doing hearings, a lot of information out there, uh, really identifying some of the major causes for the need for reparations, housing discrimination, mass incarceration, unjust property seizures, the list goes on. So. I'm just here today to ring my bell, one of many. Um, I don't need to tell the full story or perfect story, but what I do want to focus on is sort of where I'm coming from in my perspective, and that's really getting at the scale of harm and the opportunities for repair here in Philadelphia as I see them. So this is where I start. Again, Vanessa, you nailed it. I am data person. That's sort of where, that's my starting point for thinking about a lot of this. Um, I'm sure this is a familiar metric for most of us. The Fed releases it regularly, and it appears so often in the media that many of us, I'm sure, have even stopped looking at. Wealth, it's the wealth gap between, um, between white and black households in America. Wealth is what we own minus what we owe. Personally, I'd be very interested to see a version of this uh, data that shows what we own plus what we earn and plus what we owe is that really gives a full picture of the kind of lifestyle that you're able to afford for your household. But this is the metric that we have. It's focused on wealth, which moves intergenerationally and very conveniently, we can track it back to the 1960s. So the blue line uh, up here shows the median household wealth by year for white households. The purple line down here is black households. Hispanic and Asian lines are not on this particular chart, but they are similarly uh, much lower than the white line. So the first thing that we notice is that this gap is widening over time. This is not some residual impact from housing segregation in the 30s and 40, 40s. This trend is very current, very alive, and very well. The second thing I notice is the scale of this gap. As someone who looks, works a lot with data, I'm used to needing statisticians to suss out the significance and the correlations, but not here, right? This picture is so crystal clear. Forget $200 for pass and go. White households out of the gate get $137,000 more in household wealth than black households. Those are some very big bootstraps. So, the other thing that I do when I look at this chart is I begin to impl place some, um, some events along the timeline. And the first one that I always start with is uh, right here around 2000. It's a personal date for me. That's when I entered this professional fight for economic justice. Um, and after 20 years, um, I really had to face the truth that my work was not making any difference, right? And I think it's important to say I didn't feel guilty. Um, what I felt was a little stupid and naive, right? Um, it's hard to face the fact that my work in the federal government with nonprofits in the private sector was all kind of for naught, right? It wasn't having the impact we want. It wasn't moving the numbers. Um, and then I start placing other lines on the chart. 
I see. You can see the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, Community Reinvestment Act, Wall Street Reform, even in 2010. All of these laws designed to move these numbers, but none of them are having the impact that we want. So I've seen fair lending programs at banks and financial institutions of all sizes. I've seen multi-year fair lending investigations. In all of this work, I spend so much time with a lot of very well-paid white people. We have to go here, right? There is a fair lending industrial complex full of people like me who really, really, really care. Lawyers, statisticians, executives, regulators, consultants, all of us are working in this industry, but we're not having the kind of impact that we hope for. So look, there's no shame in being stupid. The world is stupid. Everyone's shit stinks, including mine. But it's time to stop doing the things that the way we've been doing them. It's especially time to stop the blame and shame game. That's not bringing anyone to the table to make it right. So don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Let's bring ourselves to the table. Uh, restorative action needs to happen and it needs to be locally led by the communities impacted. We have so many amazing restorative justice experts right here in Philadelphia. They come from the black community. They know how to do this work. We need to show up, we need to do it. It's not hard to listen, speak the truth, grapple with some hard histories, some big numbers and push opportunities to realize repair and dignity for this city. And with that, that Vanessa, back to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. We've gone about a minute over, but I'm glad she got to get all of her comments in. Thank you all for joining us, and hopefully we will see you next month. Tim, you Bye, put everyone. up the final slide. It's a reminder that next month uh, we will be having recording sessions that everyone is invited to attend.